at the federal level, a budget deal was made. And to get more about that, I wanted to reach out to Senator James Langford. Good morning. Hey, good morning to you. How are you? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. And uh, are you in Washington still? Or are you back home? I am actually back in Oklahoma and glad to be here. I, I could not get out of Washington fast enough <laughs> this time, I can, I can assure you. Well, tell me about the budget deal now. I, I've read all kinds of serves and volleys on it. Uh, I, right now, I'm, I'm pretty enthusiastic about the, uh, the, the possibility of the uh, exports of oil being, uh, the, that ban being lifted. You know, that, that's a huge gain for us to be able to export oil, and uh, that is one of the many big areas. This deal was one of those classic Washington deals that there's as much bad about it as there's as much good about it. Mm-hmm. And so my great frustration is that I had to deal with going through the reality of this. So what I did is I broke up with the staff, and I took the tax portion and broke up with all of our staff with 2,200 pages of it, taking it a piece at a time so everyone could go through section and fine-tooth comb and to start digging through what works, what doesn't work, where's the good, where's the bad, where's the ugly in it. So we had oil exports in it. We had an increase in um, defense spending, which was extremely important to us, mm-hmm. to be able to start fixing some of our defense numbers. We had some reform in Social Security that I have pushed on for a very long time to try to get some uh, reform in some of the Social Security areas. Uh, we had uh, cybersecurity areas. One of our main vulnerabilities that we deal with right now are international actors trying to reach into our systems. And so we had some changes in law to try to help us with some of those international actors. But we had a lot of stuff that didn't get in it. We're negotiating with the president, and uh, that was the big challenge that we had is try to be able to solve that as well. Uh, and I cannot wait for 13 months from now for us to be able to <laughs> negotiate with a different president. Uh, but there, there are some key things that were in it. I would tell you oil exports, as I mentioned before, uh, but Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, this uh, reaffirms again that the president cannot move those prisoners into from Guantanamo Bay. And one of the other key areas that's not being discussed is that this prevented the president from giving away the Internet. Uh, the ICANN registration that the president has wanted to move to an international body, it finally sealed that to say, no, he can't do that. Uh, so a lot of things that it pre- uh, prevented him from, uh, a lot of things that uh, we put into place that uh, finally will help our state in many ways. Well, that's that's good. Were you? I mean, was he as obstinate as ever on on some of these sticking points, or are you starting to see him mellow a little bit? Oh no, there, there's no mellowing here. For okay, the <laughs> I, I, I can assure you, and there's no mellowing for us as well. Uh, the focus that we have is the last year. We know he has nothing to lose. And he's going to try to change different uh, spending uh, lines. He's going to try to do a lot of different things that he's done couldn't couldn't do by executive order because of uh, pressure of the American people. But the courts continue to be able to step in. We continue to step in and fight in different areas for funding. One of them is in the uh, Obamacare, even that we won in this omnibus deal, is that we cut out what's called the Independent Payment Advisory Board. What many people saw early on is the quote unquote death panels. Uh, that is a group that could actually look at uh, any section of. Uh, medical spending and say that section of medical spending, uh, this iPad board is just going to unilaterally say, no, it costs too much and we're not going to do it anymore. We took the funding away from that independent payment advisory board and killed it this year. Uh, that was a very significant Obamacare win uh, in the middle of this uh, debate as well. Uh, Senator James Langford on News Radio 1000 KTOK. Can I get you to hang on? Because I wanted to ask more about oil exports and uh, and about how soon we can start seeing American oil exported. Can you hang on? Okay. Uh, James Langford on News Radio 1000 KTOK. But Senator James Langford continues with us now on uh, News Radio 1000 KTOK's Matthews in the Morning. Senator, the uh, ban on exports of uh, petroleum products from the United States, that is being lifted. When does it officially lift? Uh, that is lifted right away. Press okay. The signature, and it starts through the process immediately, which is extremely important to us. As you and I have talked before, mm-hmm. we don't get out of the budget hole that we're in with just spending cuts. We've got to have economic growth as well. Uh, and the only area where we've had significant economic growth in this Obama economy has been in energy up until the past year. And then there's been a huge uh, glut that's happened worldwide, and we've not been able to compete on that worldwide market until now. Well, I also have, have got to believe that's one of the reasons Saudi Arabia has been pumping out even more oil, because they kind of saw this coming, and they don't want another competitor. That is correct. Uh, Russia started to do the same thing, actually. Uh, they don't want a competitor because the bigger issue is not necessarily Saudi Arabia. It is first Russia. Uh, the geopolitical power really comes from trading energy with another company, and the United States has been prevented from doing that. Uh, when we can go to into Europe and say, we can provide oil for you and we can provide natural gas, as we will start doing next year, uh, as you know, that uh, about three years ago, I worked through the process to try to get natural gas exports lifted. That will start occurring 
uh, this spring, our first customers will be Spain and uh, England, uh, actually, where, where we'll start exporting natural gas to them so they don't have to buy from Russia. Uh, we can do the same things with oil as well. Uh, it's about a $170 billion uh, annual economic growth figure that happens with that for the United States. It's a lot of jobs. It's not necessarily jobs in the boardrooms uh, of oil companies. It's out in the field, uh, folks that are actually working completing wells and service jobs that are out there. Uh, because we're able to have two places to have our customers, both uh, American refineries and uh, when we have enough to be able to also send for international refineries as well. Well, uh, and that will that have some insulation for us? Because I know everybody here in, in the Oklahoma City area has been really nervous with the price of oil being as low as it is. Will that somewhat um, insulate our domestic uh, energy programs here because we will have somebody to sell to? Correct. What, what, it, what we hope it will provide and what all the economic models provide is it will take the bottom out of the dips. We're still going to always see the rise and fall of oil prices. It's not going to take that away. Uh, but it will hopefully take the bottom of out, especially for the jobs that are in the field, and some consistency would be provided. And it's really dealing with types of oil. I mean, many of us in Oklahoma understand different types of oil. There's heavy crude and there's light sweet. Most of our refineries in the United States want the heavy crude. Most of the refineries worldwide want the light sweet. We're finding a lot of light sweet in the United States now, more than our refineries want to purchase. So we literally have a product in the ground that the world wants to buy that we can't sell up until last week. And with that vote last week, uh, much against the president who threatened all the way along that he would veto this thing all the way along, he's signing it. Uh, and we'll start to be able to sell light sweet crude around the world. Which, by the way, environmentally is a lot safer, is it not? Oh, it, well, we, we produce oil cleaner than anyone else in the world does, by mm-hmm. far. Uh, when you take heavy crude, uh, there's just other products that are in it that have to be separated. It's a more complicated process, which our refineries have the technology to do. And uh, they can take heavy crude and they can take all those other elements, break it up into smaller pieces, and sell each one of them. A lot of the international refineries don't do that, can't do that. And, uh, and so it's a better, better bet for them to get the light sweet with all the other, without the other extra products in it and for us to be able to get the heavy. We'll work through this process in the days ahead, but I would tell you the key thing is we can start uh, looking towards more jobs in the field in Oklahoma and for Oklahomans, and that affects every area of our state, as you know extremely well. We're facing as a state a $900 million shortfall. It's not going to get corrected immediately with the start selling international oil, but it will start providing some hope to a lot of individuals that had great oil jobs, which, which pay higher than just about any other job out there, uh, that those jobs will start coming back. Well, that makes me feel a lot better, you know, the, the way you put that. And, and then I've got to believe uh, your constituent oil companies here in Oklahoma have been anticipating this as well and, and therefore are hopefully delaying any more um, reductions in force that they may have to do. Well, that will obviously be decisions that they've got to make yeah. uh, across different companies. But I would tell you it's extremely, for us, extremely important for us as a state to deal with several areas that were in this omnibus. And as I mentioned before, there's as much bad about this, and I've had so many people that have reached out to me that they're frustrated and they're mad about different parts of it, and I've told all of them, I agree. Uh, There are a lot of aspects of this I do not agree with, and this ended up being one of those classic Washington, D.C. compromises that frustrated me to no end. Uh, And as I worked through the process and read through, I was put in a bad situation where there are things that I like and there are things that I do not like in this. And uh, my job is now to identify some of those things I don't like and spend the next year trying to eliminate some of those or to be able to correct it. And uh, that's what we will do uh, as a staff. Um, But we also had an opportunity to be able to do some things that are extremely important for our state and for our nation and, quite frankly, for economic growth of the country. I mean, you go back into the history of the nation, Senator, and, and, and you see this from the very beginning. I know it frustrates people, but this is the, the, this is the process of, of government. Uh, Merry Christmas, uh, Senator Langford. What, uh, what is uh, Christmas at the Langford household going to be like? Well, it is a gathering. Uh, my daughter's back in from college, and we will all be uh, together for Christmas and cannot wait uh, to be able to sit around and have a quiet moment to be able to spend together. And extremely grateful. And I do have to tell you uh, that one of the things we don't talk about enough are the folks that are the troops overseas and the folks in the intelligence community that serve overseas and law enforcement and such that are out on Christmas Day, that while we are all enjoying some peace and safety in a quiet day, uh, they're still keeping watch. I I can't tell you I I thank them enough for what they're doing to serve the nation all the time. Yeah, I need to look up that um, that Marine Night Before Christmas poem I publish on social media every year. Senator James Langford, thanks for joining us, and Merry Christmas to you. 730 on News Radio 1000 KTOK.